Okay, thank Part you. Part two. Linda. I got told off last week that I didn't have props, so I thought I'd double down with props today. Um, but, yes. Brilliant. As our little ones head down. So exciting. I love the sound of little feet just heading down, doing things. Um, a lot less scary when you can hear them rather than when they go dead silent. Slightly more concerning. Anyway, um, good morning. Let's start with that. Good morning. My name is Dan. This, um, it's my absolute honour to be here to share with you. Um, this is part two of a two-week series. So last week um, we chatted, we started looking at the concept of lonely but not alone. And this is week two. So if you missed it, if you want to go back and refresh, again, scan the QRs. It'll link you through to our website. Or if you jump onto YouTube um, and search GBCF Church, you can access not just last week, but all the sermons or sermons for the last couple of years um, as we've been preaching through them. It's a great resource um, to flick through a friend, potentially, or to catch up for yourself. Lonely but not alone. Last week, we talked about loneliness, we talked about isolation, we talked about the fact that one in three adults um, identify as lonely. And we asked the question, what is our responsibility? What do we do about it? And last week, we focused very much on the fact that, first and foremost, as Christians, we believe that the solution to loneliness is God, as is the solution to many things. Um, We talked about the fact that um, in life we can have bad connections. In life sometimes the connection can be weak, that, you know, um, you're trying to get that reception, it just doesn't quite connect, or you're trying to load a video and it just takes forever and it buffers round and round. Get that weak connection or an inconsistent connection where um, it drops out from time to time as you're travelling across um, from Bendigo to Shep or wherever it might be. And we talked about the fact that sometimes our connections can be limited, again, with that phone example that we can be, that it might not stretch to the end of the house or you might need to chuck a repeater in and that sometimes of connections and relationships can feel weak or inconsistent or limited. But we looked at the fact last week that God is the opposite of that, that God is strong. That no matter what we're going through, that we can connect in with God and he gives us the strength to go on. We talked about the fact that God is consistent, that uh, we looked at David who was wandering through the wilderness, who was being pursued by Saul, who was um, having someone chasing him, wanting to kill him. But even in the midst of that, of the wandering through the wilderness, that God was with him. God was consistent. And we looked at the fact um, that God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. He's always with us. That there's no distance, there's no height nor depth that we can go that separates us from the love of Christ. And if I was going to summarize all of that, we looked at the fact that God is enough. And all of that, when we talk about loneliness, when we talk about that, that deep aching within, God is enough. And for some of you, I'm saying nods, and that's something that resonates with you. You may have gone through a time of loneliness, a time of feeling so away, so um, an emptiness within you. And someone wrote that uh, loneliness is the soul's cry for the feeling of God. And you may have learnt in that moment that God is enough. But for some of you, you might go, you know what? We might know intellectually, we might know academically, we might know theologically or doctrinally. The Bible says that God is enough, but sometimes, sometimes it doesn't feel that way. And sometimes there's there's an emptiness and we can seek after God, and yet it doesn't feel like God is enough. And we kind of sit in that and go, what's the deal there? Because Scripture says He is. Scripture says that God is enough. Scripture tells us and we know it. But there's something else that Scripture says as well. Scriptures say that we are called to be co-laborers with Christ. Scripture says that we get to partner with God in His mission. Um, At the end of Matthew, when Jesus is ascending, or just before He ascends, He has what we call the Great Commission, where Jesus says, go out into all nations and tell them um, about the things that you have learned, baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Surely I'm with you to the end of the age. We are called to be the hands and feet of Christ. 
So in the midst of God is enough in our loneliness, we get to be the answer as well. And that's what I want to look at today. The fact that we are called to be the hands and feet of Christ. We are called to be the answer to a lonely world. We must become the church, not out of obligation, but out of opportunity. We must become the church, not out of obligation, not because, oh, we have to, I guess the Bible says so, therefore I guess I'll go helping people and show love. But now we have the opportunity to do that. The Bible says that we love not um, out of ourselves, but we love because God first loved us. We get to show love, we get to connect with other people, not out of the goodness within ourselves, because I know that if I look in the mirror by myself, there's not a whole heap of goodness there. But as I hang out with God, and as I spend time with God, the characteristics and quality of God sit within me, and out of that overflow, I get to share Him with others. There's an opportunity there. So before we jump into some scripture and some quotes and some text, um, would you join with me in prayer? Father God, we thank you that we get to be here at church, and whether that's physically in a building or whether that's connecting online at another time, Father, we thank you that we can connect in with you and that we can connect in with others. Father, I pray that as we explore your scripture and as we look at what our world is like and what's happening around us, Father God, that you would reveal yourself. God, that you would stir something within us that we would hear from you. Father God, may your words be resounding loud and clear. God, may my words just fall away. Father, do something within us today, we pray. Amen. First thing that I want to kind of look at um, is this concept of loneliness versus isolation. Loneliness versus isolation. Because we can be lonely without being isolated. You can feel lonely in the midst of a crowd, and perhaps sometimes that is the most lonely situation. When you've got lots of people buzzing around you, but you don't feel connected. There's this, I'm not sure if beautiful is the right term to use, there's this uh, deep, perhaps, quote um, from David Beckham, who um, back in 98, um, 1998, the Soccer World Cup finals, uh, he was playing for England and he gets sent off the field. Um, So one of the star players gets sent off the field um, and he gets sent, uh, he has to sit in the locker room and wait till the end of the game. Um, England lost, they got knocked out of the finals um, and he essentially is blaming himself. And this is what he says He says, when the England players came back into the dressing room, no one breathed a word to me. There was almost complete silence. I could feel my stomach tightening even more. I gulped, breathed in, and gulped again. I was in a packed changing room, but I had never felt so lonely in my life. I was isolated and afraid. I was trapped in my own sense of guilt and anxiety. And what stands out to me in that quote, it's quite a long piece, um, but the fact that it doesn't matter who you are, can be one of the world's best soccer players at the time and still feel like you're not enough, still feel that you're unable to connect with his team who he'd been spending years training with and working with. But even in a situation, he felt isolated and alone. And if you're in this church at the moment, if you're in this building and you feel isolated and alone, firstly, well done for having the guts to come into a room that you may not know people. Um, That is massive. That is so cool. I grew up in church um, back in Melbourne, and when I got to Shepparton, I had this challenge of, oh, I I want to connect into a church, but I don't really know where or what to do, and I Googled stuff and jumped online and said, churches in Shepparton, Um, and yeah, GVCF popped up, and I was so afraid to come in here on a Sunday morning that I rocked up on Thursday afternoon and just sat in the car park and looked at the building and went, okay, I think I can do this. I probably sat there for about 10 minutes. I don't think we had any cameras or anything at the time, but it would have been weird because it was this random who just rocked up, sat there. Yeah, it's a common thing, though. It's a 100% just to be okay with it. So a massive thing to take that step and to enter this place. 
So well done, congratulations. We hope that this place becomes or feels like a family, a community that you can step in. Um, not on my notes. Last week, uh, I got to preach part one, and um, for various reasons, the majority of my small group were away. Thank you, Meeks and Co, who were here. Um, but there was this kind of, this, there was a loneliness that I felt even on stage, because on here, you know, it can be a little intimidating when you've got 100 faces looking at you, and you kind of look out to that sea for a familiar face with someone safe, and um, there was just kind of, oh, my crew's not here. Um, and then today, anticipating that people weren't going to be here, it is amazing to see a lot of my small group family. Hey, guys. Um, but just to stand and to worship with them is an incredible feeling to have family, even if they're not by a family, around. I found this really interesting thing. One of the... Something I do... Um, I guess during COVID and post-COVID, my YouTube consumption has gone through the roof. Um, and one of the things that intrigues me is listening to what I would call our modern-day philosophers. Um, individuals who have hundreds of thousands of viewers, of subscribers who follow them, um, and they just chat and to camera and talk through what's often referred to as shower thoughts. Um, and there's this guy, uh, his name is Daniel, um, who, in a video, and there's this juxtaposition of exploration of deep thoughts while he plays a lawn mowing simulator. And it's a half hour video of this guy playing a video game, mowing a virtual lawn, and just talking about stuff. And he does this thing about where he talked about isolation. And he said this. He said, isolation is powerful. Isolation, it's like, it's like nuclear power. It's like it could either be a nuclear weapon or nuclear energy. Uh, kind of, there was a much more to it. He talks about that in prison, that one of the worst things they can do to you or the greatest punishments is to put you in isolation. And that that can strip you back and it um, demeans you, it takes away your humanity, it takes away your connection to the world. But then also he talked about the fact that many artists and comedians and um, this world of creatives will often put themselves in isolation where they kind of turn down the noise, what Kyle was talking about today, turning down the stereo so you can park a little bit better, taking out that noise and being able to reflect. And he talked about having meetings with yourself and all that kind of deal. Um, and I wasn't sure if I'd um, say it, but I'll, I'll throw this quote in. A little bit later on in his uh, talk, he, he says this. I think that's why people like church so much. It's because they're actually able to take the time to reflect on their lives. It's the one sacred time per week where you really do think about the choices you've made, the consequences of your action, and how you make other people feel. And then the, his very next sentence is, and you guys all know I'm not religious in any way, but, um, and kind of goes off on this tangent, but to have that acknowledgement that there's something important and powerful that we do. And, you know, he, he's taken that from a secular perspective. He's looking at church from a completely non-godly perspective and seeing the value and power of it. How much more when we consider that we dedicate time to connect in with the God of the universe? I think that's pretty cool. So loneliness versus isolation. Loneliness is not the same as isolation, but often they do come hand in hand when acknowledging that fact. And the other thing that I wanted to kind of quickly jump into or dive into and have a little bit of a look um, is this concept of singleness versus marriage. Singleness versus marriage. Because um, something in my day-to-day, -day, I, am, I am single, I'm not married, I don't have a partner, and kind of you go, what do we do with loneliness? Is the answer just get married? Is that the deal? If we jump into Scripture, Genesis 2, at the very beginning of Scripture, we see God who looks at Adam. He's created this incredible world. And he looks at Adam and he goes, it's not good for man to be alone. A little bit later, he creates Eve and he says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and he shall be united with his wife. So scripturally, it looks like God's solution to loneliness is go get married. But on the flip side, if we jump into Scripture further on in 1 Corinthians, Paul has something else to say. If you jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 7, um, it's, uh, Paul says that, I wish that all of you were as I am. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say it's good for them to stay unmarried as I do. And it's this weird thing, because on one side, 
at the start of scripture, we see God going, it's not good for man to be alone. Create a wife for this reason. A man and woman, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united with his wife. And then we kind of work through the pages of history and through scripture. And on the other side, Paul's like, hey guys, stay single. <laughs> Daniel translation. You're like, so what's the deal? What's happening here? How do we balance these two concepts? Now, I've been a little bit cheeky because on the scriptures there, you see it refers to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, yeah, chapter 7, verse 7, A, and then a little ellipsis, and I've jumped into verse 8. I think what the solution or the answer to it is found in the second half of verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7, part B, says this, but each of you have your own gift from God. One has this gift, and another has that. And quite simply, Paul goes, life as a single guy is great. I get to go around and he travels around and he tells the gospel and he preaches and he builds up churches and he acknowledges that there's power in that. But acknowledges that, hey, actually, there's power in the family unit as well. There's power in married couples. There's power in staying together. And it doesn't matter which way you go, but God provides and God feeds into that situation. So there's the balance between the two. A little earlier today, Linda mentioned we had a wedding here um, on Friday. Super exciting. Congratulations again, guys. Um, We had a wedding here, and one of the most common scriptures that gets preached on or that gets read out at a wedding and that got read out at this wedding here, um, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. So if you've got your Bibles... Um, with you. If you could turn with me to Ecclesiastes. It's one of those really little books that I always struggle to find. So I find Psalms in the middle and go Proverbs is after that. And then Ecclesiastes is like three pages after some Proverbs or lasts for about three pages. Uh, but there's some powerful words in here. So Ecclesiastes chapter four, and I'm starting in verse nine. And if you've been at a Christian wedding, you no, know, if you've been around church, for a bit. This is probably a scripture that you have heard before. And it says this, two are better than one because they have a good return for their works. If one falls down, his friends can help him up, but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Unless it's summer in Shepparton. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And when you hear those words of the beauty and the power of it, you understand why that's read out at weddings so often. It talks about the power of uni, the power of one plus one, and then at the end, the power of one plus one plus one, when you put God into the mix as well. But what I find interesting about this is it's not just a marriage scripture. Because while you may work with your partner, not everyone does. You don't always work with your husband or your wife. I'm not sure if I'd want to work with my wife if I was. I know how I go with my colleagues and being able to wave bye to them at the end of the day sometimes is really good. At, at, at school, not at church, just clarifying. Work at a, at a, I work at a school as well. But, you know, sometimes, look, sometimes at church as well. See you guys in eight hours or whatever it is. Um, but as we read through this, you know, if one falls down, a friend can help him up. If light, you know, maybe you might be, yeah, that, if two die down together, Cape Warm might be more of a couple thing. But um, though one may be overpowered, two can defend it themselves. And there's this beauty in this. I, I've chuckled over the last 48 hours. I've seen this scripture in action quite a few times and probably because I've had my mind about it, but just kind of across the last, yeah, last couple of days, I've seen situation after situation after situation. I've seen it read out beautifully at a wedding. I've seen it um, Friday night. We, my next door neighbor had an unwanted visitor um, and he and his partner um, were able to confront and prevent that unwanted visitor from entering their home. Um, and it was this kind of fairly confronting situation. And in the back of my mind, I'm going, ha it's the scripture at work. Um, <laughs> on a much lighter situation, I was at Kmart yesterday for some stupid reason at midday. 
I'd kind of planned my day and went, oh, I'll go here, then here, then here, and then got a bit later, and then somehow wound up at Kmart at 12 o'clock. And the line was like to the back of the shops. It was, you know, the counter stuff is in the center, and the like half a shop's width of line, or length of line lining up and queuing just to pay for your stuff. And in front of me was this beautiful old couple where the lady was kind of shuffling along, and the husband was like, right, sweetie, what do we need next? And she would stay in line, and he would go and pick something <laughs> and come back to line, then go and pick up something, come back to line, then go off and come back. And uh, there was a building frustration because this little lady who, who looked like she had one item in hand, by the time we got to the registers, had about 50 things. Um, but it was this beautiful concept of how much more can you do with someone alongside you? We had um, youth dinner last night. Um, at the end of term, as a youth group, we, we celebrate and um, the leaders chuck on some sort of dinner. Um, again, just a beauty of seeing people coming together. There was like five guys in the kitchen cooking a full, like, three-course meal. It was amazing. Um, but seeing people come together, that power of unity. Even today in church, um, I love serving communion because you, when you get to the uh, couples who have been together a little bit longer, they have a system where one couple one of will get both little cups and the next one will get the two wafers and then they do a little swapsies. Um, it's great to watch. Uh, but again, the system, the principle in action. And friends, you could take your friends' communion and help them as well. It's not just a marry thing. Um, but this power of two being so much more powerful this concept of two being so much more powerful than one on their own. I need to invite someone to go shopping with me next time. <laughs> I think is my takeaway. A couple more scriptures kind of in this space. Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 both talk about the fact that we are the body of Christ. Um, and Linda, I'm going to invite you up to help me with this um, a little bit. <laughs> It's a bit of a preschool illustration. It's a primary school illustration, but it's one of my favorites because A, you get some very interesting results, and B, it stands out. Yeah, we can, yeah, we can do a stool. We can do a stool. Um, and as, as Linda's preparing, we'll, we'll jump in Romans first, and then we'll jump into Corinthians. So Romans chapter 12, New Testament. As I flick around... Romans chapter 12 says this. Verse 9. I'm getting, getting attention pulled by a plastic toy. Um, have I got the right verse? 4 to 8. There you go. I read 9 to 12, which was the Ecclesiastes. 4 to 8 makes a lot more sense, although love is great anyway. Um, 4 to 8. It says, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him prophesy. Oh, sorry, let him use in proportion with his face. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is to leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. <coughs> Paul talks to the Romans, he talks to the church in Rome, sorry, about this concept that we all have different gifts and abilities and that as we work together as a body, it functions well. He gets a little bit more... Um, Explicit's not the right word, but a little bit more intense in 1 Corinthians. So flick across, it's a few pages in my Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we've got little Mr. Potato Head to help us out with this. So 12 verse 12. Again, the same author writing. He says that the body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. Thank you. Demonstration of one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit. Now, the body is made up, sorry, is not made up of one part, but of many. 
If the fool, sorry, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for this reason cease to be part of the body. Or if the ears would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. For if the whole body were just the eyes, I'm not sure how you're going to do this. Are you going to rip it all off or are you just going to pull the eyes off? Either or. <laughs> if the whole body was just the eyes, It's preschool toys. This is what I'm getting. It's good, good palmer growth going on. If it was just eyes, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were just an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be, just as Linda so feels inclined. If they were all one part, where would the body be? But as it is, there are many parts, but only one body. So we put him together. Can we have a a clap for Linda? Thank you for assisting, putting our body back together. And the glasses are important as well. He's going to watch everyone. Right. Watch it. There's this lesson, and it is a simple lesson, but it's a powerful lesson. That so often I feel, I go, what's the point? I don't feel like I'm part of this. I don't feel like I'm you know, able to do what all oh, that person can do. And in doing so, we run the risk of the temptation of stepping away. You go, nah, I'm not as good as them. I can't do what they do. I'm not part of this. But in doing so, we pull ourselves away. I'm not going to deconstruct the potato head again, but you, you saw what happens. It looks incomplete. It doesn't function the way that it was designed to function. And if you're in small groups later today or later this week, one of the questions that you're going to talk about, hopefully, or that you're encouraged to talk about, is what do you feel your position is? Because not all of us are able to be feet and go places. Not all of us are the hands um, where we have capability to, you know, I wish I could play a guitar. I can't. My my fingers are weak and I am sucky. Um, It hurts. I I last about two minutes, and it does not sound great. Um, You know, what is it that you do do, though? Maybe you're the ears. Maybe you can listen to someone, and you provide that comfort. Maybe your eyes, where you see something that many people miss. Maybe you're the guts, where you digest a really tricky situation, and you're able to pull out the nutrients, the good on it. Maybe your heart, and you feel that heartbeat of God and what he calls us to do. It's only when the body comes together, only when we are able to bring our little part do we contribute, and does the body work the way it's designed to. Last scripture that I kind of want to focus on is Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, and as I was prepping for this, something stood out that I hadn't realized before. Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, says this. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good, or good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And every time that I've read this scripture, in my head, for some reason, I've read it as, for you are God's masterpiece, or for you are God's workmanship. I've read it as a single, as an individual thing. I don't know, some sort of blindness, reading blindnessy thing, or my brain's just processed it weird. But I've always read that scripture as a singular thing. 
But reading over it this week and mulling over it, scriptures say, for we are God's masterpiece. Again, it's this collective language. Now, a few weeks ago, I was with um, a bunch of mates after school, um, and we, we decided we'd go to um, the art teacher's place, actually, and we, we each did a little portrait, a little painting. Um, and in themselves, they went... Mine wasn't great. <laughs> Others were slightly more impressive. But as we put them together, it formed this really cool collage of different... I think there were native birds, and it kind of it brought together power that individually, if you looked at one of them, they were like, eh. Um, but together, they were powerful. So today... Got another illustration. Steve, props, you're welcome. Um, and what I wanted to do is kind of demonstrate or illustrate the fact that we need to work together. So, <clears throat> my masterpiece on my easel is lacking a little bit of something. It's got a couple of pieces in there, but it's lacking a bit. And within the room, sorry, you have to participate and engage. Um, in each kind of section of seats, under one a chair, there is a little package under your chair. So have a quick look under your chair, see if you've been um, specially nominated or selected based on where you sat. It may be under the chair next to you. Caleb's got one. Caleb, jump on up. They're in little Christmas wrapping packages. I can guarantee you they're there. They only got put there this morning. So there should be one in each of these columns. They're kind of in the middle-ish. Oh, we've got another one. Thank you, Tim. Is there any from this side? Rod, you might need to be doing a bit of searching around because... Yeah, you've got a few empty seats around you. See, this is encouraging you to sit with mates, because if you sit with them, it lowers the chances. If you sit by yourself, you've got a whole heap of chairs that you're responsible for. Okay, we've got number... We've got it, Rod. All right, one, two, three. Was there one from this side? I'm still waiting for one on this side. It might be, I don't know, Cullen Smith's somewhere around yours, maybe. Franzi, Jason might be under yours. I can't remember. It's somewhere in that area. Or Oceans, maybe? Maybe I shouldn't have taped it that well <laughs> to the bottom of the seat. Yes? No? Not there? Lil? Hang on. Hang on. There might be. There we go. That's the sound of discovery. <laughs> Brilliant. Jump on up. And what you guys have is a challenge that in the next however long it takes me to preach in the next section. In your packages, you should each have some puzzle pieces. I initially was going to do individual puzzle pieces and then realized half the church would be up here and thought maybe we'll, we'll, we'll pack it up. Um, but I'm going to see if you guys are able to put together our wonderful masterpiece with the little pieces that you have. So go for it. I might um, shuffle it a little bit across this way. You can collaborate and work yourselves out on how it might be. Now, as for the rest of us, if I can do the whole, like, split your attention away, because, look, that's probably more fun than this. I want to think about it. When we're doing a jigsaw puzzle, what do you start with? Corners, edges, yeah? Generally speaking, corners, edges. They don't know this, but I have these here as well. They'll be fine. <laughs> start with a corner, you start with an edge. And so often, I kind of thought, if I was a puzzle piece, and I was just on the edge, how often do we feel in community, if we're on the edge, we're not important? How often do you go, ah, oh, I'm not really in the center of everything. I'm not right in the midst of it all. I can't be that important. I'll just kind of not contribute my part. And sometimes, actually, the other thing about this, if you are on the internet, it does look like the Arthur meme. Um, there, there's a picture on the internet that goes around of like, from Hey Arthur, um, which is a really old cartoon, but it's been brought back and he shakes his fist and he's really angry. And like, sometimes you feel like you're a joke. And that might be another reason why you're like, you know what, I'm not important. Or other situations, you might go, like, what is this? 
which way around does this go? I was trying to do this puzzle. It's designed for preschoolers. And I picked up this piece. I'm like, I genuinely do not know which way this piece was. And it took me, I had to put it aside and then bring it back out later to try and figure it out. Because I'm like, what is the deal? And sometimes we look at ourselves and, or you hear a sermon that goes, yeah, are you the ears or the eyes or the feet or the guts or the whatever? And you're like, I don't know, maybe I'm a fingernail. Like, <laughs> I don't know what I am. And we exclude ourselves. And we go, well, not important. Well, it's not cool. <laughs> Would you like a piece? <laughs> pieces. Okay. Pieces. Takes the pieces. But what we realize is that without every piece, we struggle. Without every piece, if I held those off and hid them from Caleb, if I did, you've got the pieces now. But if I did, that would have been pretty mean because it means that you can't complete the whole thing. That no matter how insignificant, no matter how on the edge, no matter how weird or confusing it is, it's not important. Do I still have? I do still have one. <laughs> I forgot about this one. This was meant to be at the start of the illustration. <laughs> there you go. How do we go? Well Give him an applause. <laughs> they formed it. There you go. Good tilt. Well done, guys. Good job. It's a Christmas nativity. Thank you, Debbie Sloan, for bringing in a puzzle. Um, that was kind of... Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. This makes me wonder now where the rest of the wrapping paper went, but okay. <laughs> but again, there's this power. There's this power in unity. This power of coming together, even though you might feel like you're on the edge. All the more important when doing a puzzle, to have those edge pieces in place. It builds context. You might feel like you're, I don't remember, I think it was that piece where I'm like, where does it go? I thought it was that way around for so long. And then I realized you had to turn it around and fit it in place. But in context, as we realize who we are based on the people around us, you might go, you know what? I'm not sure what God has made me to do. But when we start finding our place in community, we start finding out our purpose. And we're like, oh, what's the deal? If I feel so isolated, I'm so alone. One of the steps we have to do is to take a physical step out and to acknowledge and to go, hey, how can I find a home? Whether that's Shep is your forever home or just temporarily while you're here, we find our peace. We find our place. So what? What's the deal? What's the point? I've been talking at you now for two weeks. How do we wrap all this up? There's a couple of things, a couple of scriptures that I kind of want to land with. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, says, tells us to carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens. And Zach, I'm going to be a pain. I'm sorry, but I'm stepping off stage. As a camera person, and... Again, acknowledging our parts. Can we um, acknowledge our camera people, our tech people, our sound people? It's often a thankless job. No one looks at you unless you're doing it wrong. So I'm going to acknowledge them. Um, when I first came to church, when I first came to GVCF, I remember it was about four weeks in, maybe five weeks in. And at the end of the service, I'd had a really hard week. And at the end of the service, I was, sitting, I was sitting about here, I reckon. We had different chairs. They were white and they had fold-down seats. And at the end of service, the only thing within me was calling out and going, God, I need someone. Please send someone. And by the end of service, everyone else had filtered out. And there was one person, I think it may have been Deanie, who lovingly looked at me and went, he looks like he's deep in prayer. <laughs> Put a hand on my shoulder and then walked off. And everything within me was, no, stay, please. 
but I didn't have the words at the time to ask that and to say that. I felt lonely, despite being in a room of 100 or whatever people. Galatians 6 that says that we're to carry each other's burdens, that we're to sit with the person who's calling out for it, whether they physically call it out or not. Carry each other's burdens. Hebrews 10, 24 tells us to spur on each other, encourage each other. And let us consider how we may spur on one another towards love and good deeds. That's what Hebrews 10, 24 says. Encourage each other. There is so much good that happens in this church community. There are so many amazing stories of people taking courageous steps and doing things that are really scary, but God has called them to do. One of my favorite things as a youth group, we were down at the lake about a month, two months ago, um, and we, we had, had some, I think we had hot chips, and there was a homeless guy, someone who looked a little bit worse for wear. One of my leaders was like, hey, Dan, can I give my chips to him? Can I have a conversation? So beautiful. I was calling out and stepping out and carrying a burden. And little things happen. Encourage it. Spur each other on to love and good deeds. And the last verse after this, verse 25, says, And let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Meet together. Spend time together in community. Check in. Hey, what are you doing for Christmas? Again, as a single, I know for me, one of my biggest apprehensions of being up in a town where all my family is away is getting to a holiday event and going, so do I just sit at home and like <coughs> celebrate by myself? And, you know, hanging out with Jesus is cool, but... Having a family to celebrate stuff is really important as well, yeah. Carry each other's burdens. Swear one another on. Don't give up meeting together. All the more as we see the day approaching, as we head closer to the time of Jesus' return. Would you pray with me? Hey, God, thanks for today. God, thank you that we can be in community. And God, whether we feel part of community at the moment or whether we feel like we're on the edge or not important or isolated or alone or whatever the situation, Father, thank you that you have provided a community for us. God, we thank you that you don't want anyone not part of your church, but each of us are called to step up and to step in. And Father God, my prayer for, for me to begin with and for every other person in this room. God, may we see others through your eyes. God, despite our loneliness or our contentment and fullness, God, may we have your eyes to see the other person who might be looking from the outside like they have got all together and they're content, but maybe so lonely inside and may not have the words to ask and articulate it. Father, especially as we head into this Christmas season, a, a season that is so often painted with, it's about family, cheer and togetherness. God, may we keep an eye out. May you lead us, guide us, have a sensitivity to those who might not have that family or might be in pain because of family. Father, we know that family is not always brilliant, that situations can be really, really tricky, and sometimes they can be right down unhealthy. God, may we as your church family be a place of healing, a place of growth, as we say, a place of encouragement and equipping. God, may we show your love to all those around us. In your name we pray.
Amen. Just before we head off, a couple of practical things I want to encourage you with. As you head out into tea and coffee, have a look around. Maybe chat to someone that you don't know or that you haven't talked to in a while. That person who's really good at hiding and, or pulling out their phone and doing quick checks on there. If you want to help out in our community, um, Linda talked about earlier our um, church events that are happening, our park outreach that's happening on Saturday. Whether that's, if you feel like you can come in early, bring a trailer, bring a ute, chuck some stuff on, help set up, pack down, or play some games, turn a snag on a barbie, make some snow cones, they're always fun. Um, or just greeting our community. You know, as a church, we love the fact that we get to jump into our local community, into the local park, but so often at those events, we're really good at hanging out with GGVCF guys or being doing a job. And our community comes across and tries to say hi to us and we let them connect and do their thing by themselves while we often silo up. Come with intentionality to say hi and to connect in with those who God has placed us in the midst of. Invite people along to events. We've got carols, we've got um, Christmas Eve, park event, lots of different things, maybe to your connect group, to your small group. What are you guys doing? This is the last official week of small groups, um, so make sure you do tag in with your small group leader, find out what's happening, but maybe have that conversation. What's each person doing for Christmas? How can you be that community and that support? Um, Bible study is wrapping up this week as well, so they've got their final thing, come along Tuesday night. Otherwise, Tea and coffee outside, if you'd like prayer for anything, whether it's been talked about today in the sermon or something that's happened throughout the week, feel free to come down the front. We'd love to pray with you or feel free to contact the office as well. Otherwise, God bless and have a wonderful day.